Hi, welcome to uh, the UCLA Health MD chat webinar. I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Katherine Mogul and I'm here uh, to talk to you all about understanding your child's emotions and we're going to take a developmental approach as we walk through this today. Uh, just a reminder to please uh, ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, sorry, hashtag MD, UCLA MD chat. Um, I will be happy to answer questions uh, towards the end of this webinar. And uh, we're going to just get started right off the bat with a video of a tantrum uh, so we can kind of all bring ourselves into the mind of the child, into the mind of a parent. I think um, every parent can probably relate to that moment when uh, you just are about to enter that power struggle with your child and it's really hard work to be able to manage um, helping your child through some tough emotions while at the same time setting a limit or a boundary with them. And so I, I just think this quote from John Bowlby really sums it up that you know, parenting is such hard work that if we really do value our children, we simply must um, cherish our parents. And uh, this is perfect timing because we're just coming off of Mother's Day in May and heading into June for Father's Day. Um, so it's just really important, I think, that we remember that parenting is such tough work and perhaps the hardest job that most of you have in life. So uh, parents can start with talking to their kids about four basic feelings. There's clearly a lot more feelings that exist, but these four basic feelings seem to be uh, the most universal that most people can relate to and most people experience um, in everyday life. So the four uh, most basic feelings we have here are mad, sad, scared, and happy. And a parent's job is really complex when it comes to emotions because uh, these feelings can uh, be along a continuum. So if you can think of feelings along a, a feeling thermometer, there's really a range of feelings. So for example, happy, there's a range of feelings from content or joyful all the way up to ecstatic. Or for mad, you can be a little bit mad, you could be annoyed or frustrated, or you could be really, really, really mad and furious. And most kids don't have the ability at a young age to figure that out. What are the different ranges of emotions? Um, and a parent's job is really to help them with that, to help expand their uh, emotional vocabulary and uh, the way that they can put into words how they're feeling in the moment. So we're going to start with uh, infants and uh, think about a parent's job when it comes to raising an infant um, in terms of emotional development. The task of infancy is really to bond with a caregiver um, and uh, to understand that their needs are actually important. And really, uh, in infancy, uh, children come into this world without the ability to fully regulate. They rely on their caregiver for that. So things like feeding, they rely on a caregiver to feed them, diaper changes, uh, sleeping, they need a parent to maybe help them self-soothe so that they can get to bed. Um, so we think of parents as the external regulator of the child's emotions. And in that, um, the parent, even in the first six months, is teaching the child about feelings. So every time the parent responds to their infant's cues um, and meets a need and can give them some pleasure, which is sort of one of the emer emerging emotions in infancy, um, the child learns about feelings and about feeling states. So uh, just an example of this is that a child's smile, uh, they don't come into the world smiling. 
Um, but after a few days, and only a few days, they do smile. But this smile is actually more of a reflexive smile. It's something that just happens with the neurons in the child's brain that sends off a note to the rest of their body when they read someone else's smile. So when the caregiver smiles at them, they smile back. It doesn't actually hold emotion yet until over the course of the first six months of life, the parent starts teaching them that and uh, that there is an emotion tied to it. And of course, this isn't verbal teaching. Parents aren't saying necessarily, you're smiling, you must feel happy. But what happens is when the parent smiles back at the child, there's all these neurochemicals that go off in the brain and helps with bonding and a whole other host of um, development that makes the brain develop and grow. And um, that's where over time, over the first six months, the child will learn that when I smile, I actually feel something. They don't know that that word is happy yet. Um, and then they move into toddlerhood. And what happens uh, with kids in toddlerhood is they start walking, they start exploring, they're becoming independent. And um, here they actually learn that there's consequences for their actions. They learn um, to respond to their parents' negative cues. And so what this means is um, as they're exploring and, and going out in the world, um, toddling around, they inevitably come in contact with some or dangerously close to some sort of danger, right? Maybe it's a cord that's on the floor or the corner of a table or a plug. And um, the parents go, no, don't, <laughs> stop it. And all of this um, kind of introduces shame for the child. And now shame not necessarily being a bad thing, it actually helps the child to know, oh, I need to stay away from that plug or I need to stay away from the corner of that table. Um, but for the first time, parents are sort of introducing these negative words to their child because up until now, they've probably been celebrating every first step, every, um, every time the baby has reached for something and gotten it, the parents have really celebrated that. So they're also learning about pride and being proud of themselves at the same time. Then come the preschool years, and what's happening during the preschool years is that um, the frontal lobe is really developing a lot more, um, where the kids are gaining more control over their limbic system, which is um, basically our feeling center. And um, they're also learning to talk and use more words. So as their vocabulary expands, their ability to put emotion, emotional states into words expands. And so here is where you start seeing not just mad, sad, happy, and scared. You start seeing things like excited. Um, and so kids uh, start understanding a little bit more that there's a difference between two feeling states. Um, and here they also start paying attention more to the feelings of others. Um, so empathy starts to emerge. And this is really mostly in the context of their caregivers. Um, that they are able to read other people's feeling states. Um, it may not happen with a complete stranger yet at this point. And uh, once kids move into school age um, and they start going to kindergarten, first grade, they really, uh, and on, um, they continue to develop emotional awareness, emotional expression, but here is where some of the regulation of feelings comes in. They start learning coping skills. They also uh, start improving what's called theory of mind, which in a nutshell is the child's ability to see the world from another person's point of view, that they can imagine that, you know, even though I liked stumbling up, uh, upon this turtle, um, that my parent looked scared, and so maybe my parent didn't think that that was okay. Um, and so here is where mixed emotions come up. They start learning that you can actually have two emotional experiences to the exact same stimulus. And that's really important for further development of empathy and also for them to be able to imagine a different feeling state. So later in life, if they're sad, they also know that they can get through that sadness because they have coping skills and they can imagine feeling happy again. And then adolescence hits, and um, in adolescence, it's in a way, we've gone back to the two-year-old um, who's just learning to walk. Uh, we have adolescents who are really trying to gain independence from their caregivers. They are uh, maybe having their first job. They have best friendships. Their friendships really emerge as uh, the context in which they're learning um, about themselves and others. And they start, um, having more abstract thinking. So they can think about all the complexities of this world um, and with that can come 
some negative feelings, some anxiety, some sadness, um, as they contemplate uh, their role in the world, what life means, all of these more abstract or even more existential things. Uh, they also will uh, develop at this, at this stage uh, uh, what we call emotional autonomy. In other words, they really realize that I don't have to feel something just because my mom or my dad feels it. So they feel um, intentionally sometimes different from their caregivers. They're very aware that just because um, my mom or dad or someone close to me, my caregiver, said that I should be happy. I don't necessarily feel that way. And this can be hard um, as a parent because your child starts um, feeling something different from you. You're not necessarily as in sync as you once were, perhaps. Uh, but all of this goes back always to parents. And I like this visual because it really shows that the individual, we as human beings, um, everything we experience feel, do, the way we act on this world is all in the context of other systems. Um, so that can be school systems, healthcare systems, but the most kind of prominent one is the family system. And so we really need to think about and hold in mind the family system when we're thinking about the individual or the child. And again, this uh, goes to the importance of caregivers. So what can you as a parent do to help uh, expand your child's emotional thermometer? How can you help them develop a lot of coping skills so that when life brings them disappointment, they have their first uh, breakup or they have a fight with a best friend or they get yelled at by their boss? What are the skills that you want them to have? And all of this really starts, the most basic building block here for the parent to teach this is attunement. Attunement is really a system of communication between the parent and child. It's a way that the child expresses something. Maybe it's dissatisfaction. Maybe it's, um, I got my hand stuck in a chair and I can't get it out. Um, or maybe it's a bid for the parent's attention. Uh, and it's like, mom, I, I want your attention right now. I need you, I want you. So the parent's role here is really to observe their child read the cue and decode the cue, which sometimes is the hardest part, and then respond to it. And when this happens, the child then signals back to the parent, that was exactly what I needed, or hey, that wasn't quite what I needed, I'm still distressed. And that then sends this back and forth between the parent and child. Um, sometimes we call it a serve and return um, interplay between the parent and the child. But this is really the key element so that the parent can pay attention to what triggers their child's emotion and then be able to respond to different emotions. After a parent has the ability to uh, really understand what their child might be feeling, it's important to start labeling those emotions. And one of the easiest ways uh, and the most playful ways to do this uh, without it feeling like a teaching uh, moment, like a lesson, is just to play with your child. When you play with your child, you, um, especially if you're following their lead and just being curious about what they're curious about, you are teaching uh, your kid that you care about what they are thinking, what they're doing. You're showing them that what they do is important and matters to you. And you're also helping increase their self-esteem, um, a whole host of really good things that come from a parent just attending to their child. And some of the easiest ways to show your child that you're attending to them are to narrate their play. So simply just be a sportscaster. Watch what your child is doing. If your toddler is playing with, um, I don't know, a toy uh, dog that they're kind of pulling along and making the dog walk, uh, just say, oh, I really like how you're making the dog walk. You're trying really hard at that. Um, and you can also reflect. A lot of parents I talk with are really concerned about their child's vocabulary and increasing their verbal expression. And sometimes parents will do that through asking a lot of questions. What noise does this animal make? Uh, what, what color is this? What color is the fire truck? Instead of asking questions, we can um, actually help increase our children's verbal expression by just reflecting back what they have said. And this is so simple, but if the child says, the dog barked. You can say, yes, the dog barked. Um, and that lets your child also know that you're paying attention to what he said and what he said is important to you. Here, another important um, task for a parent is to practice redirecting 
rather than saying, no, don't stop, quit, not. Um, there are things that we need to tell our child not to do. There's things that we need to say, don't, because there are immediate dangers. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's better to try to avoid those words in case you really, really mean it. That way your child will know when you say, don't run in the street, you really mean it. Um, but when you redirect, you can try to just uh, shift your child's attention. Uh, come up with a puppet and start playing with the puppet and make it look really fun and interacting. Or say, oh, look at this over here. And oftentimes that will work uh, so you can avoid uh, that more negative um, way of that we all have to be with our kids sometimes, but you can limit it to when it's strictly necessary as opposed to when you're trying to teach and model emotional labeling. So from here, once you've helped your child expand their vocabulary, help them understand feelings in their body, uh, you can practice and teach uh, positive coping strategies. So you know this, you know what your child likes to do. You know if they really like a particular game on their iPad, or you know if they really like um, getting a hug from a parent when they're upset. You know if they really like to play basketball. So whatever the things uh, are in this world that bring your child joy and comfort, you can start labeling those. And when your child feels mad or sad, you can say, it looks like you feel really frustrated right now. Why don't we go take a break and take three slow deep breaths or go and um, play a quick game on the iPad or go on a walk together. The other thing parents can do is really model appropriate emotional expression. I get asked this all the time from parents who are like, you know, I think I'm supposed to shield my kids from my feelings and only show them happy feelings. I want them to think that the world is great and loving and uh, friendly. And those are all really good goals. But what will happen if a child's only been exposed to those feelings is, one, when it does con come time for them to have a breakup or have a, a fight with a best friend, they may not know how to manage those feelings. You can uh, inadvertently send the message to your child that only happy and positive feelings are okay. And that's not what we want. We actually want our children, as they grow up, to be able to uh, acknowledge all of the range of emotions and be able to cope with them. So the first step for that is for the parent to start expressing a full range of emotions. So, you know, when a parent is frustrated with a teller at the bank who maybe uh, made a mistake, you can say to your child, I'm really frustrated right now. Just putting that emotional label on the feeling state that your child is probably observing anyway can be so helpful to them. I actually went into a first grade classroom and I was teaching the four basic feelings and I was saying mad, sad, happy, and scared. What do you think uh, is a red zone feeling on the feeling thermometer, feeling thermometer? And some kids were saying mad or sad and one kid raised his hand and said exasperated. And I just thought that that was the best thing that this six year old actually knew that word and um, probably he had heard his parents say it. Um, but that's an example of probably a home that has a wide range of emotional expression um, in a verbal way. The other hard task for parents here is that uh, you've got to keep your cool. And this is probably the hardest thing that most parents have to do. Um, thinking back to the video we showed at the beginning here of the tantrum, um, if that parent, uh, if their feeling thermometer is kind of going up into the red zone and they're feeling uh, really emotional and not using all of their frontal lobe, so not really using all of their ability to reason and think clearly, they may then start yelling at their child. And the child's already in the red zone too, so uh, it's like no one's really listening, no one's really understanding what the other one is saying. So um, in these tense moments where if you look at this picture, you can imagine that probably this mom <laughs> is feeling exasperated um, as she's trying to direct her child to do something and her child puts her hands over her ears. So if this mom can, instead of yelling, just take a deep breath, take a beat, take a moment, distance herself from it, just for a half a second to kind of gain her composure before she goes over and tries again with her child. You can imagine that the resolution of this little outburst might go much better. So in addition to parents modeling and using feeling words, we also want parents to model positive coping strategies. So just like you figure out for your kid that they like basketball or they like to go on a walk, 
figure out what works for you. And um, we have the whole list here of things that can help you get to green and they're wide ranging. Um, but it may be things like taking a bath. It may be calling your sister. It may be taking a walk. Whatever your coping skill is that really helps you, if you, when you use it, label that for your child. Say, you know what? Mom got really mad at the bank and when I came home, I called my sister and I vented and now I feel better. Or I came home and I took a deep breath and now I'm ready to have fun and play with you again because I was able to calm myself down. This teaches children coping skills, but also teaches them that they don't have to worry about you, the parent. If mom or dad get really upset, mom or dad can take care of themselves and they can calm themselves down. Some other ways that you can practice um, emotional regulation in families um, is you know, take a feeling thermometer, uh, print one out and uh, let your kids color it in and stick it up on the refrigerator. Maybe at dinner each night you can say a red zone and a green zone moment from the day from each family member. Uh, if you don't want to use the feeling thermometer or red zone, green zone language, you could simply say, let's each say our thumbs up or our thumbs down for the day. For younger kids, you might take a mirror, a hand mirror, and actually practice making silly faces and mad faces and scared faces. And having your child look in the mirror and really look at how their face looks, appears in the mirror as they're making those faces. You can also help kids think about when they feel a certain feeling, where in their body they feel it. So um, a lot of kids have heard the term butterflies in my stomach. So you can use that and say, okay, what does that mean? Sometimes when people get a little anxious, maybe they're nervous because they have a spelling test the next day, they might have some upset in their stomach. So helping them to label that and link where in their body they feel different emotions can be really, really helpful. Um, here's just another example of a feeling thermometer that a child could color in and uh, just again make it kind of playful so that it's not all about sitting down and having a conversation about emotions. Also you can do this through reading and I love this activity. Um, just take a book that has a lot of pictures in it, maybe a lot of pictures of animals or, or human depictions that have feeling faces and um, go through a search through the book and look for different feelings kind of a scavenger hunt through the book. You can also use uh, something that's called dialogic reading, which is really just, essentially, you can take a picture walk through the book. You don't have to read every word that's on the page, but just turn, open the book, open to any page, and say, what do you see on this? What do you think is happening on this page? What do you think the tortoise is feeling? What do you think the rabbit is feeling? Um, and all of that are ways that you can weave in emotional labeling, emotional expression, so that in the moment when you're finally having a tantrum and having to deal with it, your child already knows those feeling words. They already know those coping skills. So you can, in the middle of that tantrum, say, we need to calm down. We need to go and take three deep breaths, and then we're going to go take a break, just like how mommy takes a break before she calls her sister, because that's what makes mommy feel better. Um, feeling charts can also be really, really helpful. Uh, this is a great way just, you know, if you have it on the refrigerator, when your child comes home, you can say, how was your day? What feelings did you have today? Uh, and it's just a great conversation starter. Uh, you can also make a list of coping skills. You can make a list of things that can help kids get from the red zone down to the green zone. Uh, so in other words, find their own getting to green strategies. Um, I just want to end with uh, acknowledging that we have a lot of really great programs here at UCLA that can um, help teach parents, help work with kids around uh, tough feelings. And um, I put a few up here. Uh, and feel free to contact us if you have any questions. We have some that really focus on um, infant and parents. That's the Family Development Project. We have some that focus on uh, preschool age kids, um, the SEEDS program, helping them get ready for school uh, and uh, the transition into school and really focuses a lot on social and emotional development. Um, the, the CARE Center, um, the uh, Child Anxiety Resilience um, Education and Support Center has really great resources for you and the Family STAR Clinic, the Family Stress Trauma and Resilience Clinic. Um, so uh, here is uh, some contact information for me if you have any questions about our center or some of the work that we're doing, those programs, uh, we're happy to be available to you um, as a resource. So. 
Uh, I would like to open it up now for any questions that people may have. Um, and a reminder, you can ask them on Twitter using hashtag UCLAMDChat. Okay, we have a great question here. Does certain animation or shows help enhance or regulate my child's emotions? Um, well, there's actually a great movie that just came out this year, an award-winning movie uh, called Inside Out. And this uh, movie, I think, really takes a, a good glimpse into the life of a child. And I think for parents to watch it is really helpful to see that children's emotions are so complex and sometimes you're looking at your kid and you're like I don't I just don't get it what is possibly making them so sad or so mad um, but it really uh, can be a conversation starter if you watch that movie with your kids I think you could have a great jumping off point to some really nice conversations about their own emotional experiences and about yours as well I've heard some parents you know ask about TV or a few times during this talk, I've said, you know, let them play for a moment on the iPad if they have a favorite game. And uh, we certainly don't want to overuse that coping strategy like any coping strategy. We want to have, uh, you know, a wide range of them and not overuse any one of them. So uh, for a parent, it may be fine to have a glass of wine, but you don't want to overuse that strategy. For a child, taking a break to play their favorite game on the iPad may be fine for 20 minutes, but don't overuse that strategy. Now that said, there are some great resources um, and games that actually have uh, teach feelings and teach about emotional regulation. One example um, is uh, an app that we created here called Focus on the Go, and there's a version of it for foster families as well called Focus on Foster Families. Um, and there's just some great uh, games and activities that can help kids to learn different feeling words, learn coping skills, and figure out some ways that they uh, strategies they can use to help themselves calm down. Um, also, another question here is mind-body approaches, and are these useful for uh, children and families? And uh, the answer is absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of work that's happening now about using mindfulness, even in kindergarten classrooms and in preschools. Anytime you can connect um, what's happening in a child's uh, mind, you know, what are the feeling states they're having with their body, you're helping them to, to identify yet another way that they can identify when they're triggered. So if you teach them, okay, what happens when you feel sad? Well, I start crying. Okay, so when you have tears in your eyes, that's a cue that you're feeling sad. Or I get those butterflies in my stomach. That's a cue that I'm starting to feel a little nervous. So when I feel those initial triggers in my body, what are the things I can do to calm myself down? And that's where things like deep breathing, um, you can take a stuffed animal and place it on your child's abdomen and teach deep breathing that way. Teach them to bring the breath all the way down into their stomach and rock the stuffed animal up and down. Sometimes I say it's like rocking the stuffed animal to sleep on their belly. Um, so that's essentially belly breathing. Um, also, you know, teaching some of the coping strategies like exercise, let's go on a walk or play basketball or go on a run. Those are other great ways that kids can see that um, they can get their energy out and it teaches them about how their brain and their body are connected. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share um, about emotions and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you.